Thanks for joining. My name is Ferenc Fejes. I'm from Ericsson Research with uh, Hungary. And uh, the work I present here uh, were done this, I mean, most of the work done at this summer and uh, with the help of my uh, intern students, Peter and Martom. So what is TSN? I don't want to go really into details because it was presented uh, yesterday by Johannes. And uh, there was a, uh, like, I don't know, maybe like five years ago, there, one, there was another talk about TSN. And there was uh, much a talk about how to synchronize clocks. So it's partially, they all, of, uh, they all uh, mentioned what TSN is. Uh, my take is TSN is a short for time sensitive networking and it's aimed to solve the deterministic forwarding uh, in OSI, OSI layer two. So it's it just for la layer two things, not else. Uh, and what I mean by deterministic communication uh, is this term is refers to for mainly four things, high reliability, uh, bounded maximal latency, and that's important the bounded and the maxima, and low jitter, low latency variation, and no congestion related packet loss. If any of these happens on a TSN system, this might have uh, configuration uh, problems. Okay, and why TSN is required? Uh, since the 80s, there was many uh, uh, field bus solution try to uh, solve Communicist, communic, um, deterministic communication problems. And many of them were really successful. There are like dozens of them, like uh, uh, 40 or 50 standards. Uh, uh, many of them uh, based on uh, uh, serial communication. Later, many of them uh, just implemented over Ethernet. So the main ones like the Profibus, Profinet, Ethercat, Ethernet IP, don't mistake with Ethernet, <laughs> which is another thing. Modbus, Modbus TCP. Modbus TCP is the Ethern, uh, is Modbus over Ethernet. And unluckily, uh, all of them are, uh, all of them is, j they just don't work together. They don't, they can, uh, uh, as, and resulting, uh, fragmented ecosystem. So if you want to connect domain with these different, uh, using different technologies, you have to buy relays and uh, converters and switches, otherwise you won't work. And it's hard to make it work with that. So, um, yeah, a typical TSN networks look like this. Uh, the traffic is uh, almost always go to only one direction. You have not, you don't have to worry about the back, uh, the back pass. You're just sending traffic and try to forward it to the listener. So it has a talker, some bridge, uh, some bridges between the talker and the listener, and uh, and that's it. Uh, maybe, of course, the listener can also act as a talker, but mostly it's is don't have, like you think about UDP, like uh, communication. So you don't have congestion control, only made uh, the, uh, the flow control is basically hand by, handled by the application. Okay, so what IEEE does, uh, they started the uh, TSN task group at the uh, Ethernet working group and uh, they try to equip the Ethernet with different uh, TSN, uh, with different deterministic communication capabilities. So that was TSN is. So the TSN term is uh, really close to the close to the e IEEE. Uh, deterministic communication is not, and uh, they are. That's a, a standard as standardization. Uh, activity basically so if you look at there are many tsn standards if you go to the uh, home page there are like uh, dozens of standards and you find that uh, there are standards with the uh, extending the bridging with tsn capabilities the 
dot one q and you the small letters here are substandards or extension standards for the dot one q and there are standalones tsn standards which are not extensions of the uh, dot one q bridging they are uh, they itself they work as own entity without a bridge for example so and now uh, the in more interesting part how much do we have uh, from these standards in linux uh, linux basically act as a uh, multi-purpose but uh, mainly uh, for two purpose toolbox uh, they have uh, linux have uh, capabilities and functions for deterministic transmission and deterministic forwarding. That's two different things. The deterministic forwarding largely covered by that TSN bridging uh, activities and the deterministic transmission is, they are not some standardized things. They, those are just APIs for the uh, Linux programmer. Uh, and with those APIs, the programmer can uh, develop time aware applications with precise timings uh, in and use the network with precise timings and uh, for deterministic forwarding is different that's the that's mostly the standardized things because those are many of those has to work uh, with non uh, linux capable switches so uh, there are switches with uh, uh, where the where those TSN standards implemented in silicon so first i try to going through the deterministic forwarding standards and their adoption in linux and then i mention some of the apis uh, first of all there's a time synchronization um, it for me it was hard to uh, clarify the different PTP standards and their different profiles. So the PTP is the main TSN uh, standard. There was a tutorial at the first day about the PTP. I don't go into details, but the latest iteration of uh, PTP is the, uh, uh, this is the version three PTP here. And here's the uh, uh, TSM profile for PTP. This contains a subset, uh, many restrictions or uh, to PTPv3 uh, to work in industrial em environment. Um, so basically, uh, if you're using the PTP with some telco standard, you often don't even have uh, Ethernet PDU session. So you're working with IP packets. And maybe the PTP packets uh, for time sync doesn't even handled by the intermediate nodes. They just got tuned out to the end device. And yeah, that's less precise, but uh, that's how it works. But for in industrial use cases, that's not acceptable because it's so unprecise to uh, synchronize two clocks. So the the industrial profile don't let you tunnel uh, ptp packets you have to uh, deploy your own ptp relay uh, nodes which are uh, when forwarding a ptp uh, packet they are calculating the uh, calculating the residency time okay uh, so what required for ptp v3 and uh, uh, gptp uh, Packet timestamping is crucial. Uh, the drivers used to, the drivers can timestamp packets like uh, uh, before, very close to the, the, the last part of the software basically, but they also can timestamp packets in the hardware and pass that timestamp to the uh, user. So, uh, for, for GPTP, it's required to do that at hardware, but for other use cases, it might enough precise the software. It like maybe an order of a magnitude uh, in, uh, precision difference between them. And for user space, 
there's the Linux PTP stack, and that was mostly covered by the uh, Maches uh, tutorial first day. And uh, currently, that only supports GPTP slave. The bridge mode not supported yet, or the GPTP relay mode. And we have lots of NICs supporting the timestamps. And also, there are some activity about GPTP uh, supporting switches. If you check the NetDev mailing list, like in the past few weeks and days, there are many patches about GPTP support for different switches. And yeah, that's I covered already the difference between GPTP and uh, PTP. Next is the frame preemption. The QBU and the uh, 802.3BR. Uh, for example, let, what is frame preemption? Basically, if you have a, a larger and a smaller frame, you, you want to uh, forward uh, them to the network. But the forwarding the large MTU size frame on a slow 100 megabits uh, network, uh, I mean slow for for most home or DC use cases, but it's completely fine. And that's the average on for TSN use cases or industrial use cases. So 100 megs or one gigs is the most what you get uh, basically. And if you have some safety data, which is more important than for example, the control data or other data, it might work to preempt that frame uh, with the more important but smaller frame. Uh, and that basically the frame preemption standard uh, lets you. Uh, currently, there are only RFCs. There are two RFCs, one from Intel and one from NXP. And uh, one approach is uh, using only ETH tool, that's from NXP, and one of them is using uh, multiple queues. So the there are the express frame that is, for example, the smallest the uh, express frame, and that can preempt the uh, uh, preemptable frame at any any moment of the transmission, and then that frames continues to transmit the the frame of the preempted no the preempted frame transmission will be continued after the transmission of the express frame. So uh, that has to work with one Q card, so uh, one Q Nix. So if a very unlikely case when you have only one Q on your Nick, uh, which support, I mean, the standard doesn't define you have to have multi Q. So that's why ETH, ETH tool will be enough for the configuration. The TC approach use multi Q to map the map the uh, priorities into queues, and the queues were uh, then uh, handled by the Nix Mac. Okay, and that's what I personally working on uh, these days: the frame replication and elimination for reliability. That's the dot one uh, CB. Uh, well, I have a figure maybe somewhere. Oh, there is. So for example, you have multiple disjoint paths to the, between the talker and the listener. And maybe it worse to have, worse to, it may be worth to you to invest in uh, multiple bridges and multiple cables to do redundancy between the, uh, to the talker and the listener. Which is which has benefits not just in reliability, but I will show you what in what else. Uh, it's basically two. It's one standard, but it defines some uh, frame uh, stream identification, which is only a subset of the uh, what currently the TC match and flower are capable. So, for example, you can you somehow have to identify the packets you are you want to replicate. So that's. The, so that standard also defines those tools to you, but you have much more flexible filtering currently uh, in Linux implemented, and, and that will be hardware offloadable. However, 
currently Linux don't have uh, .1 CB uh, in, uh, implementation. So if you lucky enough to buy a switch which has a working implementation of the .1 CB, you have to use the vendor provided uh, not standard configuration tool if you want to use that. And here's one example. Well, it doesn't, I think. Okay, um, what's here on in the figures, there's uh, two paths. Each of them was a real 5G pass. And of the flare is replicated the packets between uh, the two on both paths. And uh, what you see right here is the is the proportion of the uh, latencies. So, for example, here's one pass, uh, the the yellow one, and one is the green one. Those are five G pass. And at the receiver side, the flare only only takes the fastest packets which arrive. So, as you can see, the tail latency is. Uh, is is lower than in both cases because the it's like the minimum of the packet uh, uh, latency distribution what you experienced the application or at the listener after the flare elimination node so here here we see the at the listener we see the lower uh, lower rtt packets or lower latency packets. Uh, this is uh, pass stream filtering and policing. There's the QCI. It operates at the ingress direction. And uh, basically, you can, uh, you can define time like a schedule or a time gates uh, for some traffics and for, for some packets and streams. And the matching packets will be only let only let the matching packets press uh, um, the matching packets pass on their time frame. So if they are arriving late or arriving uh, before their time frame, they will be dropped or dropped after they exceed some byte uh, limit. Uh, you can do that with any type of TC filter. The one thing you have to use after the filter is the TC gate action, uh, this one right here. And at, for the gate action, I will show you a configuration example. But at the gate action, you can define uh, the time slots, the intervals, and the priorities you want to use, or whether the gate should be open or closed. And uh, there are NICs currently supporting that the offloading of that uh, action. And the QBV, that's really interesting. Many, many uh, NIC vendor and many uh, who wants to do TSN basically interested in uh, this uh, QBV one. Uh, that's the egress part. It only works on multi Unix, and uh, it lets you define a schedule how you want to drain the queues of the NIC. So, for example, you have, I'm pretty sure anyone is aware of the uh, uh, multi queue Q disk or MP, uh, MQ Prio Q disk. So, this basically an extension of mq.io. The interface is really the same, but it also lets you define the schedule in nanosec uh, precision, how you want to uh, drain the queues of uh, different priorities. And that's good for protecting TSN traffic uh, from the best effort or lower priority traffics. And this is what's in Linux, you probably familiar with the Taprio QDisk. So it's a time aware priority. It means time aware priority and the interface is really, uh, it's very close to the MQ Prio. It's also can be hardware offloaded as well. 
Okay, and this one, basically the previous two, the combination combination of the previous two. So if you use filtering at the egress, and that filtering can be used to reprioritize packets arriving at different time slots, and then that repri with that reprioritization, uh, you can use at the QBV or the Taprio at the egress. And with the coordinated configuration of the two, and also the time synced, uh, if you time sync the two port or using the software version, which when in that case you don't have to synchronize because both of the ports we are using the system clock for the scheduling. So with that, with that you can coordinate the with the coordinated configuration, you can get hop by with with good configuration, you can hope you can get hope by hope deterministic frame forwarding. And that what's the, I think the end goal was uh, in lots of uh, standardization activity. So the QCH is not a standard itself. I mean, it's a standard, but it's a standardized configuration of the QCI and QBV. And uh, so basically they call it collecting frames in some cycles and draining and there are draining cycles when they are pushing out the collected frames from the queues. Uh, I will sh show you how to configure that. I hope some part of it will be visible. So first of all, it looks something like that. For example, in the ingress interface, there are packets with unprioritized packets. Uh, they arriving in, for example, each arriving in 100 millisec uh, intervals, like an isochronous traffic. And then uh, you have, uh, you remark them, you configure the QCI to open all the time both gates, but reprioritize the traffic. For example, prioritize the traffic for 500 uh, millisec to priority one and for other 500 to priority two. And again and again, that's loops forever. And at the egress, you can open and close the gates, and, but in other way. So when you mark the packets with priority two, you close that gate at the egress and open for priority one and all the traffics collected in the priority ones collecting cycle uh, pushed out to the wire uh, in a burst. Uh, yeah, you lost some latency in that way of operation, but at least you can, uh, if you know how, if you, because you know every parameter of the network, you will know the hop by hop latency in every, for every packet. Okay, uh, and if you want to configure that, uh, it looks something like this. So here you hope you can configure the ACT gate. First, you put some filter, for example, the source IP filter. You give, give a reference clock for the, that can be a device clock too, if you want to offload, I think. And you give, a, you have to give the same base time. This is a Unix Epoch uh, nanosec timestamp. Uh, it was like yesterday or a day before, I don't know. That was the timestamp actually. And uh, uh, you can open the gates in both cycles for 500 million uh, nanoseconds, which is uh, half a sec, and reprioritize it with one, with one priority one, and then for priority two, then other, one, two, one, two. And those two are coordinated. So they are, each time they are the uh, opposite uh, stage. Okay, and this is the time of priority. You can, for example, define three uh, traffic class here, mapping those to the zero, the one and the two, uh, uh, second queue of the NIC. For zero, we don't use the zero now. And here we open the 
uh, for 500 microseconds, we open the gate zero, which is not used now, uh, for the Q zero, which is not used now, and the Q, uh, the second Q. This is the collecting cycle of the of the pri priority two packets, and then we open it. Uh, like this is a bit mask. Uh, so I show you here. So this here is three, and this here is five, and this is a bit mask for the queues, basically. Okay. So that's mostly covers what we have right now in Linux or what's will coming to Linux soon. And now I talk a little bit about deterministic transmission and what APIs you have for that. The timestamping API, which is uh, documented, uh, documented very well documented, you can have lots of timestamps. You can have uh, hardware and software timestamp at many points of the Linux networking stack. You can have per packet timestamps. So, for example, if you're interested when uh, a packet got transmitted, uh, the, but just one packet, for example, a UDP packet, you can pass a control message to, okay, generate a timestamp uh, for me when you transmit that packet, and you can do that. Uh, even you can even do that with TCP. For example, if you have, if you sending the TCP streams one million bytes, you can set, okay, I need a timestamp when I send that. Okay. And this what heavily uh, instrumented by the Linux PTP package. Uh, Linux PTP package using that uh, APIs for syncing between the system clock and between the uh, device uh, physical clocks. Okay, you have precise sleeping. That's since that's there with since a while. I mean, uh, it's introduced like 15 uh, years ago or so. And uh, you can do nanosec resolution sleeping. But if you don't want to really uh, drift, uh, you just use the clock monotonic. And uh, there is a flag for the clock nano sleep, which is the timer uh, absolute time flag. And that way uh, you can give a timestamp at the future and uh, Linux will try to wake up close to that timestamp. So you can also have the normal, not uh, un if you don't use the flag timer ops time, you can just pass, okay, I want to sleep for like half a second, but that's less precise if you schedule your uh, packets like that. And the Linux API here is the scheduled packet transmission. Basically lets you send data uh, in company with a control message metadata containing a timestamp. And that tells the kernel, uh, the QDisk, uh, at the QDisk level, when you want to send that packet or that, yeah, yeah that uh, uh, packet. It works with UDP and uh, Basically, you have to set that timestamp for the future, otherwise it send it immediately or drop it. It depends on the settings. And if you want to use that, you have to set a socket option TX time on that, uh, that particular socket where you can pass this C, uh, C mes uh, control message timestamp metadata. And it only works with the, uh, uh, the top prio mentioned before, the time of our priority, the QBB, and the e earliest timestamp, uh, TX time first QDisk. This is the ETF QDisk, uh, which can be also offloaded by some NICs. So, and if you want to use the offloaded version of the ETF QDisk, okay. Sorry. Uh, if you want to use the hardware offloaded version of the uh, of the ETF QDisk, you, you have to have synchronize your system clock and uh, and uh, 
physical clock of Dönig. Because otherwise, if they are not enough close to each other, you might have imprecise uh, transmissions. OK, uh, and I don't want to talk about that because that was largely covered by the jump trading uh, talk. So uh, yeah, you have to reduce jitter if you want. OK, and uh, here's some measurements. I generate this isochronous traffic with the tool called Isochron. It's made by Vladimir Rotem working at uh, NXP TSN implementations to Linux for NXP switches. And it's open source on GitHub. And I use that. And that can, uh, uh, that can generate packets in every, uh, what you said as a period. For example, I set uh, 500 microsec and sent like 10,000 packets and checked the jitter, basically, the difference between two packets. And as you see, you, the average is really close to, 100, uh, to 500 microsec, but it has some jitter. And that happens at the transmit, because of if it's used the sleeping method, the clock nanosleep, you have some uh, jitters, and also you have some jitters until the a message, the packet gets through the kernel and the QDisk send it out. So you can have much of jitter. And I collected the hardware timestamps. It's really the same. I mean, at the receiver side, this is also really the same because not much happening on the cable. So it's close to each other. But at the RX side, you have a so, so big jitter. So even if you're even if your uh, network is really good and you don't introduce much jitter at the receiver side, if your host is not configured properly, you can lose many of the, of the, you can introduce much of jitter. And here's, this is the same, I think this is the same measurement, but I only show you the data uh, points of the hardware RX timestamps. And I think I excluded some very extreme ones or a few, but here are uh, 10,000 packets. And it looks like this. So most of them close to the 500 microsec uh, delta, but you know, you have some jitter and noise here. So like plus minus three microsec which is not bad, I think. But, and then I tried to offload the ETF uh, uh, QDisk to the NIC. So let the NIC's hardware clock uh, schedule the packets. I pass the packets with, oh, through the driver to the uh, NIC, and it's inside timer, it's inside oscillator we can, will be used to schedule the packets to the wire. And this is how it looks like. Uh, I, I measured it many times that I didn't believe it, but it looks like it's actually really, really close to the, to the expected uh, 500 microsec plus minus 10 nanosec, basically. Or uh, here it's minus 10, basically. So it's really, really, if you schedule the packets with hardware offloaded ETF, maybe it depends on the NICs, how well it's implemented. But in my case, I use the Intel, uh, Intel E224, uh, 225, which is the EGIS, EGC uh, driver in the kernel. And it was really, really precise. So I cover most of what I wanted to tell you about TSN and Linux. So, well, what's, what we don't have right now, something like a verification tool set or verification scripts for those functions. So uh, there are lots of bugs and lot, I mean, not lots of bugs, but I found uh, uh, more, many bugs when I experimented with the, those. The QCH, for example, didn't work because 
it doesn't propagate the priorities mark to the packets. It doesn't even use that. It's just unused variables at the uh, act action, gate action. And uh, yeah, so we have some, at the future, we might have some self-test and verification tools. That isochron tools are, I mentioned you was really good. And user space tech needed uh, for coordinated configuration of the QDIS. So if you do that on between two machines, it's right. But when you have to configure a whole network, there are already standards covering that. But it's mostly uh, those standards can be implemented at user case, user space with messaging and such. So they are not there yet. And that net, I just mentioned that net is built upon TSN. It's standardized by EATF. You can, for example, MPLS, deterministic MPLS over TSN, Ethernet, and such things. Uh, they have their own functions for it. They try to standardize it for IPv6 too. Um, but that's a whole other thing that can be covered, might be, uh, in the future. And uh, so my main points, my key takeaways here, the TSN loves Linux. Uh, because most of the pre uh, standards that I presented, including the TX timestamp API, implemented in the past five years. So uh, they, they just pretty new uh, functions in the kernel. And switches with TSN capabilities are first class citizens in Linux because of uh, the distributed switch architecture and switch dev. You can use the standard TC tools to configure the switch ports and uh, configure the timings and the clocks and such. So it works pretty well. So the TSN, uh, the future of the TSN on Linux is, looks pretty good. And uh, yeah, it gives you the APIs. If you don't want to use TSN on switches, but you want to develop the time aware application, uh, Linux also gives you the best APIs for that. And that's all. So thank you for the attention. I'm, I will, there's a paper. I will, will be uploaded to the slide, uh, to the site. Uh, here I, try to uh, write down every details when they are uh, implemented in Linux, where you can find the patches for that. I collected everything from the mailing list from Git and uh, try to, I try to, uh, yeah, here are the links for the standards and for their implementation in Linux. You can use that as a reference if you want. Okay, and thank you for the attention. I, I definitely learned a lot. And the most important thing is, since it's a time-sensitive networking talk, we are finishing on time. In fact, we're early, so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, questions? Yeah, we could hear okay. you breathing. Uh, no questions online? Yeah, that's one. How about the hardware support of timestamping? Can you tell me, is, is it very, very common or where to find information about this? Uh, yeah, you can, uh, for example, there's a, there's a constant uh, macro SO, TX, HV timestamping. And if you grab that at the net uh, driver net uh, folder, you can find some, the drivers which implemented that. but other, uh, well, I didn't find other documentation of that either, but uh, Linux PTP and PTP 4 l try to probe uh, the whether time, uh, hardware timestamping is available or not. So it's an opportunistic, if it have precise, more precise clock than the software timestamping, it will go with that. You can explicitly disable that, uh, but uh, well, it's, 
I think Maché uh, covered how that uh, implemented. So if you send the packet, the uh, the NIC generate you a timestamp packet, which propagated to you by the error queue or yeah the error queue of the socket. You can access that error queue and pull on that and read. You can pass an ID for the packet if you want and send it, and then you get back a packet with the timestamp when that uh, sent. So that's how it works, the uh, hardware timestamping. Thank you. At the TX side, at least. And uh, similar at the Erics. But at Erics, you can uh, attach the timestamp to the packet if you want. Did you want to add anything? No, it was it, it was correct, so nothing yeah. to add. Thank <laughs> you. I, I, well, I, I was going to say that they actually had a very good tutorial, I think, on the first day, right? So yep. when the video comes online, I think many of the questions... But it's yeah. on the Hermit already, so if you it's have access there, to yeah. the Hermit, then yeah, you can get the raw uncut version there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any others? We are a very silent crowd this year. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. I think we are on break. Um, it's a break, and uh, we will see you in at three forty-five. Uh,